StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe, founder and host of StartupRad.io, your startup podcast from Germany, as well as the world's first internet radio station dedicated to startups and tech companies. If you haven't already done so, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button down here and leave us a nice comment. Today, I welcome Gordian here with me. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, all good. How about you? I'm doing good. Thank you very much. Um, you are here today because you are the co-founder of a company called one tool and we'll pretty soon get into what one tool actually is but as always i'm linking your linkedin profile down here in the show notes if you're using some type of uh podcasting app that actually uh doesn't doesn't provide the ability to links make sure to go to www.startoperator.io forward slash blog and there you will find um, all the links and the show notes, of course, or just Google the the headline of our interview. Sorry about that. So you are the founder of One Tool, the CEO and co-founder. Um, but you have had a pretty interesting life. I have to admit, you actually went to university not too far away from me, actually in the area of Mannheim. Can we start a little bit there and you take us through your CV? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I went to the University of Mannheim, which is like a very prestigious business school here in Germany. And I did that with a special degree program. Back then it was called Unternehmensjulis, which basically stands for uh, the law and business administration at the same time. And the reason why I wanted to study these both combinations is because I always wanted to be self-employed at some point. I didn't know if it was like in founding a company or taking over a company, but I was for sure I wanted to be self-employed. So what happened is that I chose that degree program and I graduated from there. Then moved over to America because for me, the Mannheim experience, you know, it's a very tough business school, but it's also very, very theoretical. And what I wanted to have is I wanted to study a master's in entrepreneurship. Back then, that was not really a thing in Germany. Like the word barely existed. And so I moved to Florida to study entrepreneurship in my master's there. And yeah, and then stayed in America for a while. How long have you been there and how did you... Uh, go from Florida to Baylor in Texas? That's correct. So uh, what really happened there in the, in the master's degree is that we were allowed, instead of writing a master's thesis, to also write a lot of papers about a startup that came, that you came up with during your degrees. And we came up with a startup called Locana. Locana is basically a version of Amazon. But all the inventory is available locally. So you don't get it delivered, but you can actually see what's available in Berlin, in Austin, Texas, and so on and so forth. And the reason for us moving to Austin, Texas then was that Austin had this big movement back then. It was in 2014, I think. A big movement like going local, keep Austin weird. So we thought that local retail stores would be you know, the best choice for us to launch a marketplace uh, within the States. And the only option for me to stay in the country, because not, I'm not an, a Native American, was to go via another degree program, which was my MBA, which I then got at Baylor University. And I've also got to say that they were very, very accommodating because they made me custom studies, custom programs and stuff like that, just so that I could work for one tool, uh, for Lucana. And yeah, it was a fun time until I made my way back to Berlin. Then after we finished with Locana in 2017 here to Berlin. Uh, what did you do? Did you sell Locana? Did you close shop? Uh, yeah, a little bit of both. Like we had a, techn a technology developed that was very capable of connecting to different inventory systems of local inventory stores. 
And that system, then you could see what's available. So we sold that one, um, which is nowadays called click and collect, you know, basically the backend software behind that. The platform itself, the, the big marketplace, which looked like Amazon, we closed shop and um, let it go. And one of the major reasons back then was especially visa problems, you know, that the investors, the few that we had on board, um, back then Donald Trump got elected, which is not a positive side immediately if you are not a native American, what well, as a native American, but an American. And um, yeah, so that was end of 2016. And then the beginning of 2017, I moved back to Germany. And there you got again into the startup world, uh, working as an investment scout, right? Yeah, so back then it was a really interesting project. I never really wanted to leave the States. So I had plenty of job offers and also worked for a VC part time in Austin and then had some job offers in New York City and Silicon Valley, of course. But there was one company which really, yeah, st stood out somehow. And that was Moya back then. Moya was a very new brand of Volkswagen, you know, the big car company. And they had this very massive brand of just purely investing in new mobility startups. And for that, they set up this investment vehicle, Moya, with a few billion in, in potential investment sizes. And at least on paper, my task should have been to travel around, find the companies, scout them, look out for them, and then, um, yeah, in ideal scenario, put them over into a transaction with our finance and investment team that I was part of. And uh, I already deduced from what you're saying that it didn't work out that way. And then you went on to work with another startup called Clever Shuttle. And my understanding is out of there directly or indirectly, you founded one tool, right? Yeah, correct. So what happened at, at Moya was that it was fun working there and the team was super talented. But again, if you are coming from a startup perspective and startup background, you're not used to corporate processes. Yeah? And I think that was a deal killer for me that if you realize that things are taking probably 20, 30 times longer than they should take, that this is not the environment you want to work in. So what I decided is I'm going to move to the competition, which back then was called Clever Shuttle. And they were more agile. They were the same thing in a different color, but in a startup mode. And for them, I joined as their director for growth. We did stuff like growth, business development, finance, and especially fundraising. And was responsible for raising everything from Series A to then the exit that they had. And after we triggered the, the exit, that was to Deutsche Bahn, which was or is still, I think, the biggest railway operator in, in the world, probably. Um, I was looking for a new challenge. And the new challenge that I found there is while I was leading this team is that we were using, I don't know, I cannot tell, but probably a hundred different SaaS tools. And if you lead these teams, you're constantly running in the same problems again. What happens if someone leaves the company? You need to close all these accounts. Um, you don't know who was using what, and you constantly, even if with the existing employees, you constantly chase invoices. And I just didn't want to have this. And this is why I ended up founding one tool, which allows you to on and offboard all your employees to SaaS tools and software with just one click. So you must imagine that as one dashboard where you just do one click to deactivate a user from all their tools rather than having to go into every tool like Slack, Trello, Asana, I don't know what, um, individually. I have heard several times the stories that some SaaS tools actually send over physical mail with overdue invoices to companies for employees who left like half a year ago, a year ago, because nobody really closed those accounts and that's always troublesome if you don't have like any means of overseeing who is using what on behalf of a company um it, it it's pretty easy for me i think i have a pretty good overview of what i'm personally using but as soon as you start to have like 50 people in different functions it it totally gets crazy and if you don't track it properly you're already have a lot of uh, spending, wasteful spending, plus you're lacking the overview. I think that's the point you're going at, right? 
these two things and, and the third one. So first, it's, of course, you are overspending. We see, you know, roughly anywhere 15 to 20 percent overspending. And the second thing is the overview where you have shadow IT. If you don't have control over who is using what, people just subscribe to random services and you lose complete track of it. And then the third one, and that is, I think, getting more and more important, is security. You know, does it make sense when an employee who has been gone for six months still has access to certain tools? That's a really big security threat for you. And, you know, should be worth all the money in the world to not let that happen. For everybody who was not working in a corporate, we may explain what shadow IT is. Basically, let's say I'm working for company XYZ and I use my corporate card to register something, uh, some SaaS account that I use for my job. And then I file the expenses with my travel expenses. And then at one point I leave and forget to cancel this. And uh, that's basically, first, there's still an account running, maybe with data of the company, and that the IT and uh, the cybersecurity IT and all the com all the other people in the company are not aware of. And that's a big problem, especially for companies when they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's basically a point where I do believe your tool is extremely useful. Um, can you tell us a little bit about who is using your tools? Not necessarily like reference customers, we can also talk about them, but I would talk like geography, where the people are located. I would like to talk about the size. When does it make sense to start thinking about something like that? And best, best cases, not when you have a, a data breach incident due to an account an employee opened and that never got closed, but rather beforehand. Yeah, I think the perfect and ideal demographic of a customer is firstly, it's most, most likely a startup anywhere, maybe even already seed round to series C round. Um, so what we're saying is anywhere 50 to 500 employees. And I think the most important thing is here that this startup is mostly using cloud based applications, means nothing on premise, which are locally installed versions, means pretty much every single modern startup is that. But here comes the more important thing. That startup had already discussions internally if they wanted to have a fully fledged IT team with DevOps engineers and so on to develop very complicated and implement very complicated solutions. Or that startup decided they're going to put this on hold or don't have the dedicated full fledged IT team yet to have a very simple solution. Because this is where we differentiate from others. Other solutions that are out there, they allow you to do similar stuff, but it takes a setup of six to nine months. And our setup takes you maybe an hour, maybe one and a half if you're really, really slow. So on the other side, we don't go as deep, but it just works. So if you want flawless, seamless integrations that cover the basics and maybe a little bit more than the basics, it's awesome if you want something that goes very deep into some tools, but therefore doesn't do any other tools, for example, then we're not the right solution. I was thinking basically if you have installed something on premise, that's nothing I would worry too much about because it's something uh, somebody ordered, you have invoices, you know where it is, even in a maybe in a physical sense, like it's on this computer over there. Uh, but what would worry me as an entrepreneur is if my data is somewhere in the cloud. And I think that is where you two come in. You, you're talking about starting at 50 that would be a little bit higher than i would guess uh you could start and up to 500 why do you have a limitation of 500 or is it just a guesstimate um so there's you know we're a new incumbent in this market and previously companies that are at this size starting at roughly 500 employees they've most likely already looked into a solution and back then we weren't out there so most likely if they looked into a solution they found another one now, I'm not saying that these other solutions, they're not great. They probably are a great use case. Some of them might not be 100% satisfied with them. But for us, the sales pitch is way easier to companies that have, that don't have a solution yet than to convince someone who already has a solution to switch over. Mm -hmm. I see, see, see. Um, and how does your tool work? Let's say 
one or more of the roughly uh, several thousand entrepreneurs that listen to us every week is now interested. Of course, there will be down here in the show notes the link to your website, and then they can learn everything. But can you give us a little brief overview what the people would need to do, how it would look like, and how they actually get their people like on board, meaning that they actually use the tool? Yes. So let me try to put this in words because I know it's a podcast. Um, so first thing first, when you decide if you want a tool like this or not, is you're using roughly anywhere to 15 to some, some customers, even 150 SaaS tools. Yeah. You know, the most common ones are Office 365, uh, G Suite or now Google Workspace, Slack, Trello, Asana, HubSpot, these tools, yeah? Confluence. Now, if you realize some of these tools, of course, chances are high. We only, we also most likely have all the other tools integrated that you are also using. Now, in the first step, when you sign up for one tool is we ask you to connect all the tools that you are using with our integrations. Now, if you, let's say we do that for Slack, it will show you a button, connect Slack, and you click on connect. When you click on connect, it will auto forward you to the integration that we have with Slack. So there it will ask you for your Slack username and your password. You log in and you give us access for license creation and deactivation. And that takes you roughly 30 seconds for each tool. So if you want to be part of one tool, you've got to at least somehow know already which major tools you are using. Now, let's say you connected all your tools and that took you 30 minutes. After that, we will auto pull all the information that we get from these tools. Means which users are on them, what their email addresses are, how much you're spending on them, which plans you're on. And you will have that in a very nice overview. And the overview can basically be categorized in two different ways. The first way is where we show you what tools you are using and what your overall spend for these tools is. And the second view is where we show you which users are using which tools. Now, this is just a very broad overview, but what's more importantly now is that we also pull your department infrastructure. And why that is important is because departments and teams use different kinds of tools and also different level of pricings. And what that does is if you want them to onboard a new employee, we can say, I want Joe Manninger to be part of the marketing team and if we just type in Joe Manninger, it will automatically create an email address for you. And then if we type in you belong to marketing, it will auto select the tools that are required for you to use in marketing. So rather than going then into the 20 tools that I would have to create license for you individually, we could just go and click marketing, click one click, and you are onboarded to, I don't know, Slack, Asana, Trello, and all the other tools that you are using in marketing. And the same thing, vice versa, also goes for offboarding and also just removing someone from a tool who is still with the company. I uh, was actually smiling because when you said the email, I thought, ah, uh, that's very thoughtful because uh, before the creation, before you introduce one tool, actually a lot of people may have for several reasons, uh, for example, their personal email addresses for the SaaS tools they're using professionally. May it be for the reason that they want to uh, access it from home, access it mob on, a, on a mobile device you cannot do from the company for whatever reason, or maybe that they actually have the intention, when I'm gone, I can still use the tool on company bill. Um, all of that is possible, not saying anybody is doing that intentionally, but that is something an entrepreneur needs to be concerned with and uh, therefore i really really like what you guys are doing um as people may know from uh, our description you guys are doing this tool but you you've also been in the y combinator can, can you can you take us through this journey uh I, we already established you have an affinity for the United States, um, and but you founded the company in Germany. And how did you get 
like back to Y Combinator? How did it work? How was the process? And do you have like between you and me and like uh, 10, 20,000 people who are listening to this or watching this interview, any secret tips? Uh, yes and yes. So let, let, let's go into it. Um, the first thing is we never expected to be to be part of Y Combinator. And the truth is when we applied for it, I we already forgot that we even applied for it. So the way we got in, I cannot even explain it myself. Yeah. But let's let's start here. Like end of 2019, we found that one tool. And with one tool, you know, the mission was always very big. We wanted to simplify the way we manage SaaS. Yeah. And with that, we got pretty quickly accepted to an accelerator, which was called the German Accelerator. That one is also based in Silicon Valley. It's like for especially prestigious German companies, for example, N26 was part of it. Um, we may add for our audience that we've been at the German Accelerator in New York back in 2018. And of course, we will link the playlist from there. And, and uh, you've, but I assume that means you've been part of the startups not going to New York, but going to Silicon Valley. That's correct. Yeah. Great. And of course, I have a very deep affiliation with with America and I never really wanted to leave the company. I did though. And I, I thought, you know, why not going back to where you started the other company? Because you know how the market works, how these people are working and so on. And so German accelerator was a first step towards that. And what we pretty quickly found out that the market share between the people that we would like to target or the companies, it's way easier to sell to an American company because they're way more affiliated to SaaS. Uh, in Europe, it's now slowly catching up. But, you know, two years ago when we really started it, or one and a half years ago, it was way more America than it is today. Um, I would say right now it's roughly 60% America, 40% uh, Europe. Now, uh, back then, I remember exactly how we were sitting outside there. It was a late summer and we're sitting on the bench and we had some friends that were in Y Combinator. And we talked how randomly it is to get in there and that I, you know, the chances are, I think somewhere 0.2% or so and uh, that it shouldn't be worth applying for it because of that. It's a waste of time if you spend too much time for it. But nevertheless, like beginning of 2000, no, beginning of November or I think end of October or November 2019, we all of a sudden got an email where it says, hey, you're invited to the final Y Combinator interview. And what happened is like, oh, yeah, it seems like we applied. So we looked back at our application and it showed in the timestamps that we spent like 26 minutes or so on the actual filling out the application. And, you know, secret tips. I know from so many people now that approach me that want to have tips on how to do their application that they spent way too much time on it. Like what Y Combinator really values is if you're not overselling, if you're honest and you're just typing in what comes to your mind because that's the real you and they want to see who's the real you. And I think that was a reason why we maybe have been accepted to the final interview. So yeah, then we flew to Paris and same thing again. You go through a 15 or 10 or 15 minute high pressure interview where they ask you probably every 10 to 15 seconds a new question. So you've got to be really concise with your answers. And same thing again, once you get the yes for the interview, a lot of companies prepare for it like two, three weeks in a row to, to try to go through every possible scenario. And back then we said, no, we're not going to do this. We are right now, at that time, we were in the Web Summit in Lisbon. So we were really busy presenting our startup there that we didn't even have time to prepare for anything. So all we did is, um, before the interview in Paris, we said, okay, let's just be confident and be honest. We There's probably not a question we haven't heard before. And if there is, let's just admit that we don't know the answer. And that's how we went into this batch. Um after after the interview, we got asked by the head of admissions if we can send over our prototype. So I think that's a requirement that you have something that is already kind of working. And we did. And then a week later, we got the call that we're in. And then three weeks later, we moved to Silicon Valley. That was the beginning of 2020. And then, well, and then we went into Y Combinator. Unfortunately, and that's what, what we have to say about this, it wasn't the chaos batch where Corona broke out, you know, mid of February, everyone started to get very nervous. 
by March, everything was canceled. And then even our demo day was not a real demo day anymore. Uh, we officially had it, but you know, everything was accommodated towards Corona, which was unfortunately uh, unfortunate for us in that case. Did you see an increase or decrease in interest in your tool during times of Corona? That's a good question because it, <laughs> we cannot really tell because we launched during Y Combinator. So we, we launched during Corona. So I think the interest is there. What we are seeing, and that's a hypothesis that I have, is that especially during the first months of Corona, no one had, no one had any idea how to work really remotely because let's be honest, everyone wants to be a remote company, but most companies are not. And that led to that the people that are the decision makers don't, didn't make decisions anymore, which was hard for us to sail. Huh? And now what we're seeing is a phenomena which I think will be over soon is that people are tired. And I think we see that especially in Europe, that people, they're not quick to respond. They're very slow and they, we assume that's because as we are also, we're tired from all these lockdowns. And we can see it already in the American markets where things are picking up again and conversations are way more positive and way happier. So I think this will be something for the history in terms of also maybe later for PhD candidates to research about this impacted sales and, you know, psychologies of sales. So you guys really did, did the tough thing launching during the time of Corona. Um, you guys launched your tool in 2020 and before that you started in 2019. So how were you guys funded? Did, did you bootstrap at the beginning? Did, did you get uh, external funding from the start? How, how did it work? We were very lucky to have HTGF, which is I think Germany's biggest investor, pretty quickly on board. So when we founded the company that was in July 2019, when we first started, you know, just slowly going into it, we bootstrapped for a few months. And then by October, we already, with, with the acceptance to Y Combinator, we also had the, the pre-seed round of HTGF already uh, in our bank account. Mm -hmm. um, we may add that Alex, the CEO of um, HTGF, Europe's most seed investor was published in December 2020 and if you go down here in the show notes of course we will link this interview there as well yep so what happened after that of course you're being in Y Combinator and lots of investors approach you but also truth to be told this was corona time and I remember exactly like uh, Sequoia was one of the funds sending out this big memo in March 2020 where it says to every investor, where it basically said, please don't invest right now, just take care of your portfolio companies. So it was incredibly hard for us to raise at that point. Um, we raised in total uh, until now 1.65 million. So we raised a little, a little bit more uh, after Y Combinator with a few selected VCs um, and will most likely go into the next round very soon. Um, yeah, but we'll see what happens. And of course, every in investor who's interested, go down here in the show notes. There's your personal LinkedIn profile that can link, reach out directly to you. We are already running a little bit longer than we originally planned for this interview. Um, so I would like to thank you very much for your time uh, you, for Joe. making this possible. Best of luck. And of course, we will keep track of you guys as well. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate your time. It was fun talking to you. It was totally my pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. If you are a professional looking at the European startup scene, Germany is a place you cannot miss. Fortunately for you, there is StartupRad.io, the authority on German startups. This English-only podcast brings you fresh interviews each week. Most likely, you have never heard or read anything on these startups before in English, but you will in the future. Be ahead of the curve and subscribe to StartupRad.eo podcast or check for the StartupRad.eo internet radio station. Check your Alexa for the StartupRad.eo skill as well.